and welcome to another lesson on language development. In the last lesson, we talked about the anatomy of the vocal tract of an adult speaker of a language. Um, and in this lesson, we're going to talk about how we manipulate that anatomy to actually produce the sounds of speech. Uh, so that's what this lesson is going to be about. Now, to better explain everything that's actually going on within the vocal tract, we're going to look at how brass instruments are played. And this works very well as a metaphor because the brass instrument does most of the things that the human vocal tract does, except it does them outside of the body. And so we can look at them and manipulate them with our hands. And so we can see those things more clearly than we can see inside your human body. Now, when you play a brass instrument, when Dizzy Gillespie blows into his trumpet, um, the sound that he's actually making with his mouth uh, sounds something like this. <laughs> Now, that sound is a sort of a silly sound, and it doesn't sound anything like the sound that comes out of the other end of the trumpet, which sounds like this. So when Dizzy Gillespie plays the trumpet, the source of that sound, which we call the source of that sound, is that funny little buzzy sound that he makes with his mouth. But, the, but then that sound passes through a filter, which is the rest of the trumpet. Um, and that filter will change the way that that sound sounds in the outside world. Um, and this is essentially what's going on in your vocal tract. Um, when you speak, your vocal folds, which reside within, within your voice box, um, vibrate. And that, act, that sound, if you could hear it in isolation, would sound a lot like that sort of funny buzzing sound that goes into a trumpet. Um, you can slightly change that sound, but most of the, the, the sound of speech that makes it sound like an adult speaking um, comes from uh, the rest of the vocal tract, which acts like an instrument that you are playing your sound through and will change the sound that is originally produced by your vocal folds. Now, anytime your vocal folds are vibrating, um, this is called voicing, uh, and we'll talk about voicing throughout. Um, a sound is voiced if it's made using your vibrating vocal folds. And, and, and those vocal folds are the main source used in the production of the sounds of speech. So what we're going to do first is we're going to go through the sort of main categories of the ways that you can manipulate your vocal tract to create different sorts of sounds. Um, and then we'll get a little more specific on uh, how you can do those for specific uh, for specific phones. So remember that when you play a brass instrument, you make this sort of buzzing sound. And this is sort of like the buzzing sound that your vocal cords make. Now, when you play a brass instrument, you can, you can put that same buzzing sound through a bunch of different instruments. And that will result in a sound that has different acoustic properties. Um, so much so that you can actually synthesize them using a synthesizer and be able to identify what sort of instrument you're playing. So, for example, this is a French horn. Uh, but we can also have a trumpet. Or a trombone. Right, and so these all have different different properties. Um, so if you change the shape of the filter that you're putting your source sound through, um, you can, without obstructing that sound in any significant way, just by changing the shape, you can create a sound that is acoustically different. And this is what we're doing with vowels. We change the shape of our vocal tract without significantly obstructing it. Um, and that results in sounds with different acoustic properties. So making a vowel sound is like slightly changing the shape of your instrument, right? You're slightly bending a pipe there, or you're slightly um, expanding a pipe there or shrinking a pipe there, and that will change the way that the sound resonates and it will change the acoustic properties of your vowel. Now this is also where we get different voices, right? So it, different individual people's voices sound differently because their um, vocal tracts vary slightly. Um, and it's not just from the bass source sound that they put through the, the, the filter. It's also because people have slightly different shaped vocal tracts, right? Somebody's tongue might be a little bigger or something like that, um, and that results in slightly different sounds. So now we've talked about vowels. Let's 
start talking about consonants. And there's three main types of ways that we produce the sounds in consonants. And the first type um, is produced by significantly restricting a portion of the vocal tract without blocking it. Now, a good metaphor for what this would look like is using a mute on a trumpet. So when you take a trumpet, you can put in front of it some sort of blockage that you then uh, put closer and further away from the bell of the trumpet, and it produces a sound like this. So notice he didn't actually block the sound coming through the trumpet at all, right? The sound could still come out, but it was, it was very restricted and then released, and then very restricted and then released. And it makes this sort of wah, 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 wah sound. And actually a W is a consonant like this, right? So when you say wah, wah, you're making a consonant like this. So these are sort of wah, wah consonants. And we'll come back and talk about more formal names for a wah, wah consonant. But that's what you can think of. These consonants are the ones that go wow, 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 wow. So you're not actually stopping any air from flowing, but you're restricting it um, so that it flows in a different way than it would if you were just producing a vowel. So now we come to a second type of consonant. Um, these are produced when you cut off or open up portions of the vocal tract. Now this is a lot like just changing the instrument. Um, uh, but this is different because when you make a vowel sound, you're just making slight adjustments to the instrument. Um, and when you do these types of consonants, you are changing suddenly and drastically the way the air is flowing through your, um, your vocal tract. Um, so a good metaphor for this would be that when you look at a trumpet, you can actually take pieces of that trumpet off, and it's possible to just play on what's called the lead pipe, which is that first straight pipe out of the mouthpiece you can just cut off the rest of the instrument and just play on that, that first straight pipe out of the mouthpiece, which is called the lead pipe. And so this is what this looks like when you play on the lead pipe and what it sounds like. So that sound sounds different from what we were talking about as the source sound of a brass instrument but it doesn't sound like, like the fully filtered sound through a trumpet, right? So um, what you've done is used a sort of a different pathway for the sound to go through, and it's created a new instrument. But imagine that you suddenly switched between a lead pipe and a trumpet. It would make a sudden sharp cutoff, and that's um, what we call, what, what this second type of consonant is, is when you suddenly switch the whole pathway that the sound is going through, um, and we can think of these as like lead pipe consonants for now. We'll talk about these um, further on, but these are the ones where you suddenly change up your instrument um, drastically. So finally, we come to the third type of consonants. And the, in the third type of consonant, you actually create a secondary source of sound. So this is like if you were going along and playing your trumpet and suddenly you started clapping, right? So you can either stop playing the trumpet to clap, in which case all you have is a secondary source of sound, or you could clap while you played the trumpet. It might be hard because you sort of have to hold the trumpet, but imagine you could clap while you played the trumpet, in which case you have both the vocal folds and a secondary source of sound. So this is the third type of consonant where you create a secondary source of sound using a different part of your vocal tract besides your vocal folds. All right, now we're going to go through um, sound by sound and talk about the different ways you can do these types of sound production using your vocal tract. So first we talked about vowels and how when you produce one vowel, it's like using one instrument, like a trumpet vowel, and then you use another one and it's like a French horn. So this is, vowels are created by changing up your instrument. So what does this look like in the vocal tract? So when you make the vowel E, um, your tongue gets really close to the roof of your mouth and up forward in your mouth. It sort of moves forward in your mouth, e, right? You've created, if you look at the white space in that vocal tract, that is the instrument that you're playing when you make the vowel e. Um, if you make the vowel e, your mouth is much a much different shape. Your, your um, tongue has lowered. Um, it's not as low as it can be, but your tongue has lowered significantly, and you have much more room for that vowel to resonate in your mouth. Um, now you create the vowel ah, and your tongue is actually being pushed down. It's really quite low in your mouth. Um, then you create the vowel o, oh, and now we're not only pushing our tongue way down, 
but we're also pushing it back and we're also rounding our lips, right? Create the vowel oo, and we've actually raised our tongue again, but we've raised it instead of raising it in the front of our mouth like we did with the vowel e. Um, when we create the vowel oo, we raise it only in the back. And so it's created a different sort of uh, resonant shape, right? It's like you're changing up your instrument. So there are three main things that we can consider variables, ways that we can manipulate our mouth to change the instrument that we're playing our vowels on, to change the way that we are creating a vowel using our vocal tract. So the first thing we can think about is what part of our tongues are moving, right? So are we gonna move um, the front of the tongue or the back of the tongue, right? Are you lifting or lowering the front or the back of, of your tongue or maybe the middle of your tongue? That's also possible. So which part of the tongue are you moving? Um, and then you ask, what, how high is that tongue in your mouth, right? So you could move it high up in your mouth or low down in your mouth, right? So we can talk about the back lifts up high and the front lifts down low, right? So these are different ways that you can talk about the angle of your tongue. And that's the most important thing for vowel quality. Um, but it's also important whether your lips are round or not. This is like the shape of the bell on a brass instrument, right? You can either have it be narrow bell or a wide bell like a French horn, right? So you can have round lips, rounded lips, where you, you sort of purse your lips a little bit while you say the vowel oo, or you can have not round lips, which is how you say the vowel e, for example, where, where you're really almost grinning when you say the vowel e. But you could just as easily round your lips when you say that vowel. You could just as easily say e. Right, which sounds, it's not a, a vowel that we have in English, but is a vowel that is in many languages. So whether or not your lips are round is also important to determining how you're producing your vowel. So that's vowels. Now that we've discussed vowels, we can move on to consonants. Um, and remember the first type of consonant that we discussed were our wawa consonants, our consonants that take uh, something and bring it close to cutting off the airway, but don't quite, and then release that. Right, so like a wah-wah mute on a trumpet that makes that wah-wah sound, we have this set of consonants that make wah-wah kind of sounds. Um, and, and these we call approximants. Um, and this is because when you make a wah-wah sound, you are approximating the shape of a vowel, but you are bringing it too tight for that vowel and then releasing it too suddenly to have it be a vowel. So it almost looks like a vowel when we look at the way that you form them, they almost look like vowels, but then you release it really suddenly and it creates that wah sound. So this is three approximate consonants. So an R, a Y, or an er sound, a Y sound, and a W sound, right? So in each of these, you can see that the, the vocal tract is not completely constricted. You have air flowing through your mouth the whole time you are making these, but you sort of make your mouth like you're gonna make a vowel, like those vowel charts that we saw before, um, and then you suddenly release them in a wa or a ya or a ra sound, right? So it makes these sort of sudden bursts and that sudden burst is the consonant. So the next kind of consonant that we can talk about are our lead pipe consonants. Remember, these were the type of consonants where you suddenly shift what part of the instrument your, uh, your sound is flowing through, what is the major shape of the source is shaped by which portions of the instrument that are there are you even putting the sound through. Um, and, uh, and usually the part that you can open or close is whether or not air is going through your mouth or your nose or both. Um, and usually when people talk about nasal consonants, what they mean are nasal stops, which is a type of a nasal consonant. And in a nasal stop, what you do is you stop the air from exiting the mouth, right? That's what stop means. It means you've stopped the air from exiting the mouth. Um, but you open up your, 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 your trap door on the roof of your mouth that lets the air go through your nose. So you stop the air from exiting your mouth and it goes only through the nose and it looks something like this, right? So this is somebody making the sound mm, like running, right? The sound at the end of running um, is this sound. Now notice that some of the sound is trying to flow through the mouth and getting stopped. Um, and how much of the mouth that you, you allow the air to flow through will make different types of nasal stops. So you could make one at your lips where it can flow into your whole mouth, but just not escape it, right? Or you could make your closure at the back of your mouth, right? So one of the important things when you're talking about nasal stops is where in the mouth is the cutoff. So we'll talk about this when we talk about the IPA in the next lesson, 
um, that this is how the major way we categorize different types of nasals. Now, all that nasal really means is that you're allowing air to flow through your nose. And it's possible to allow the air to flow through your nose without actually cutting off all the air that's flowing through your mouth. It means that you can, you can nasalize other sorts of sounds. Any sort of sound that allows air to flow through your mouth could also be allowing you to flow through your nose, right? So you can have nasalized vowels, which are, which sound, the, diff, the contrast in these sounds something like E, which is not nasalized, versus E, 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 which is nasalized. So E, E, um, in one of those, the air flows through my nose, and in the other one, it doesn't. Or you could even nasalize a consonant. So for example, all, which is an approximant, all could then be all, 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 which doesn't sound that different to my ears, but in certain languages, those sounds might be contrastive. It might matter whether air is flowing through your nose or not. So all versus all, right, sound a little bit different. Um, so you can nasalize other sounds, but usually when people talk about a nasal consonant, what they mean is a nasal stop. All right, so now we've talked about vowels, and we've talked about wawa consonants, and we've talked about lead pipe consonants. So now we can move on to secondary source consonants. Now, since there are a lot of different ways that you can make a secondary source with it, of sound within your vocal tract, um, there are a couple of different kinds of secondary source consonants. And the first kind is called a plosive. So a plosive is formed when you first stop the sound from exiting through your mouth or your nose, right? That's the first step is you can't have any sound going through your mouth or your nose. Um, and then you gradually build up pressure behind that closure. So if you close off your mouth to make a B and then you sort of allow air to fill up that space, it builds up pressure behind that closure. And then when you release that, you get a little puff of air, right? A little puff sound. And that puff sound is not necessarily very loud, but it's detectable in, in the acoustics of the sound. So when we go that sound I am producing without my vocal track or my, without my vocal cords at all, right? That is just the sound of pressure being released from behind a T. It makes a little puff sound. And that puff is a secondary source. Now, um, the things that matter for categorizing plosive sounds is where in the mouth is the cutoff, right? So uh, a sound that you make by cutting off your uh, at your lips would be a P, whereas a sound that you make when you cut off uh, at the back of your mouth in your velar region would be a K, right? So P versus K, right? It makes a different sort of a puff. The puff itself is filtered after you make it when you make a K sound, but if you make a P sound, the puff just isn't unfiltered. Right. Um, so where in the mouth is the cutoff is very important. Um, you can also have voicing be involved. So you can do this by go, by turning on your voice box while you're building up that pressure, for example. So you can go b, right, and that creates a pre-voiced um, plosive because uh, your voicing is involved as well. You have two separate sources of sound. You have going on behind that closure, but then you also have the release of that closure, which creates another sound. And so it's sort of a compound sound formed out of um, two different sources. This is like if you clack while playing your trumpet. Um, and how the voicing um, integrates with the release of the plosive is something that we've talked about already, which is called voice onset time. So when your voicing starts relative to the release of that plosive um, is, is what gives you voice onset time. So another sort of secondary source consonant is called a trill. This is a lot like a stop, but not exactly. So when you make a trill, you, you first stop the sound from exiting the, the mouth and the nose, just like if you're making a plosive, right? Um, pressure builds up behind the closure, right? Just like a plosive, but unlike a plosive, um, you release that pressure by letting the closure flap open and closed and open and closed and open and closed, right? You don't just have one release of all that pressure, you sort of leave it to flap in the wind, right? Um, and that creates a sort of a pop, pop, pop sound. So these are sounds like ra, ra, like when you trill your R, that is a trill sound, right? So this is another way that you can make a secondary um, source is that tap, 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 tap sound, right? Um, and, and the factors that help you decide which sort of trill you're making 
are going to be, again, where in the mouth is the cutoff. So I could go with my lips, that's a trill, or I could go with my tongue against my alveolar ridge, which is an alveolar trill, which is a rolled R, what we think of as, as a sort of a, a, a Spanish rolled R. Um, you can also ask, is voicing involved, right? So you can make that sort of sound that a horse makes. That's a trill without any voicing, right? Um, but I could also turn my voicing off and go, right? And it's, it's um, right, so you can have two sources or one source in it. All right, so the last main category of secondary source consonants we're going to talk about are fricatives. And fricatives are a little bit different from stops or from, from plosives and, and trills um, because the first step is that sound is stopped from exiting the nose, but sound is never stopped from exiting the mouth. Um, instead, you just make a narrow, 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 narrow exit, just very, very small. Um, and then you, you let the air escape but it makes turbulence as it escapes in the air. And you can detect that turbulence. It makes acoustic noise, right? So this is the type of noise that your noise canceling headphones can cancel is the sound that a fricative makes. Um, and so this sound is like a hissing sound of various sorts. So fricatives are the hissy sounds. Um, and you can make a hiss um, with or without voicing. So you can make a hiss that is just a, a, you know, a traditional hiss, sounds like sss, right? That's an S sound. Um, but you can also turn on your voicing to have two sources of that, hit, of that sound, one of which is a hiss, and the other one is your voicing, and, and that sounds like zzzz, right? So that's combining a hiss with voicing. Um, and so the factors that matter for fricatives are where in the mouth is the cutoff, right? So a s is different than a h, right? Because it goes through a different filter after you make that hissing sound. Um, but it also matters whether voicing is involved in that sound. All right, so those are all our major categories of consonants. Um, now I'm going to give you two extra helpful words. Now these types of these descriptors of different types of sounds can be combined with all the different types of consonants or most of the different types of consonants um, to help you create um, more specified descriptions of your sounds. And the first of these two words is lateral. Now, what it means when you make a lateral sound is that you are creating a blockage of some sort in the center of your tongue, in the center of your mouth, um, in the center of your face. So it stands there like a big blocking boulder, and the sound has to escape from the sides of that blockage, right? So when you, when you make an L sound, O, that's a lateral sound because, because the, the in the middle of your mouth, you've made a restriction about whether um, sound can travel through there, and so the sound has to escape through the sides. So lateral sounds are just sounds that you make like any other sound, except that the air only goes through the sides of your mouth. Um, so these are your sneaking out the side sounds, and they look sort of like this, right? You can do a lateral approximant, like o, or you can do a lateral fricative, like s, o, s. That's a lateral fricative. It sounds like a really sort of spitty, messy fricative when I do it because I'm not as used to making that sound. But, um, but you can have laterals of various different types. Um, now, the second word that I'd like you to remember is retroflex. And a retroflex sound um, is created when you just bend the tip of your tongue way back to the roof of your mouth. So these are your curling up and back sounds, right? So you take the tip of your tongue back to the roof of your mouth and you, and you go ta. Ta, ar ta, ar ta. It sounds sort of like you're saying ar ta um, in English, but um, but this is taking the tip of your tongue and bringing it back to the roof of your mouth um, to make the sound. And you can do this with with approximants. So I can have a uh, retroflex approximant like er. This is how some English speakers make their r's. Is they say er with the tip of their tongue way back on the roof of their mouth. Um, or you can make a stop like arta, arta, arta. That's retroflex. And this is what this looks like um, in your vocal tract, right? You've taken the tip of your tongue and you've brought it way back toward the roof of your mouth. So these are re re retroflex sounds and lateral sounds. And those are two other ways that you can describe sound. So a brief review of what we've talked about. We talked about how one way that you can make different sounds is by using a different instrument or in the case of the vocal tract, by altering the shape of your vocal tract without restricting it. Um, and this is how we make vowel sounds. Um, and then we talked about some different ways that you can make consonant sounds. 
Um, the first way is that you partially block the instrument without fully blocking it. These are our wah-wah sounds, also known as approximants. Um, another way you can do that is you can suddenly alter the shape of the instrument or the way that the air is flowing through the instrument um, by opening and closing your nasal passage. Um, and sounds where they're open are called nasals. And we specifically talked about nasal stops being the ones where air only flows through the nasal passage. Um, and then finally, you can create a secondary source of sound. Um, and there are several different ways that you can create a secondary source of sound. These all form consonants. Um, plosives release one puff of air. Um, a trill releases sort of machine gun puffs of air, like that. Um, or you can have a fricative, which releases a hissing sound. Um, and all of these can be combined with voicing as well, or not combined with voicing. And so this lets you have um, more different kinds of sounds. Um, and lastly, we talked about a couple different extra vocab words that can be used to modify most consonant sounds, which are lateral, meaning the air comes out the sides of your mouth rather than the center of your mouth, um, and retroflex, which means that your tongue has curled backwards toward the roof of your mouth. So this has been our lesson on how you manipulate your vocal tract to make different types of sounds. Um, in the next lesson, we'll talk about the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, that is used to actually describe the sounds that we make.